like Marcy is going to be dishing out the instructions soon, so you guys are going to want to listen to what she has to say. You guys can also admire Rich's facial hair. He sports Cat One facial hair every day of the week. He's looking good here. Okay, welcome back to another edition of the Race Recap. And I am recording this prior to the other races. So this is race number three in a three-part series called the Nuo Omnium. And Nuo is northeast Wisconsin for anyone not from around here. And we'll be racing today in a location called Nina, Wisconsin at the headquarters of Kimberly Clark, or corporate offices, I should say, maybe not their headquarters, but Kimberly Clark Corporation, which provides you with lots of paper products in your life. Diapers, facial tissue, wipes, pull-ups, etc., etc. So thanks to them for letting us use their facility on a Sunday afternoon. A beautiful day. Attendance was a little light, as you saw from the video of the uh, racer crew. And that is because it was Mother's Day. So everyone out here is being, uh, I guess, a little bit selfish, as my wife pointed out to me, so so be it. So we are out uh, on the third, third race. I am sitting in, I think, fifth place overall for the Omnium Points competition as we begin this race. And I have to say I didn't pay a ton of attention to trying to accomplish anything with the Omnium points as I was getting ready for Sunday's race. Uh, and later on, I guess we'll find out, I ended up getting something out of the Omnium race. So I ended up in third overall for the Masters 1-2-3 category. I was the defending champion of this Omnium race from last year, so uh, I guess I slipped a little, <laughs> but I think the competition was up this year. While we had smaller fields, last year we had some strong competitors, but they didn't do the Omnium. They just did uh, Saturday's race. So, uh, Anyway, you are looking on my handlebars as we're taking on the front of the race. That's a gentleman named Brian Turney who does a lot of turns at the front. Seems to enjoy pulling the field around, so it's awful nice of him. And I believe so that... The race course is 0.9 miles, so just a tick under a mile uh, for the course. So I think we call it a criterium, but it's uh, more of a circuit, more of a circuit. Super safe, couldn't be safer. So here I am <laughs> leaving on an early break and uh, all by myself, solo. So this is uh, a very unusual tactic for me to attempt, but we were on the front, it's the first lap of the race, and I thought, well, you know, no one expects me to do this. Uh, I don't even expect myself to do it, so why not give it a go, see what happens. And I thought, as long as I stick to my number, uh, just below threshold, I should be fine. And I certainly didn't intend to be able to extend this break for the duration of the race. I did have a thought process. So this is a theory. Not sure this is a viable or intelligent tactic, but it was my theory. My theory was there are a couple of strong, very strong riders in this race, and I just had the assumption that they were going to walk away from us in this race. In reality, one of them did, and we'll see later. Uh, but I thought three or four of these guys would get together, go up the road, and they'd leave the rest of us in shambles. So I thought, well, maybe I'll just go up the road first, and those folks would bridge to me, and that would make my life easier, because then I wouldn't have to accelerate trying to follow their wheels up to this break. So right now my gap is, um, I think I did that first lap. You see my, sh my head looking around, catching some air up there, and just thinking, eh, I don't know if this is really an intelligent idea. So I get to the start-finish area here, very clear of the field. And I think I slow down here. You can watch my watts. Yeah, just coasting through the start-finish area. I know I was turned around thinking like, hmm, well, if they're just going to give it to me, I guess I'll, I'll do it. So there I hit the gas again. And then try to keep that number right around 300, 310, because theoretically I should be able to do that for an hour. 
Uh, so as long as I stay in that number, I should be okay. And if I do get swept up, I'll have at least a little something uh, for the end of the race. So that was my thought. Um, so that's what I did here for a little while. Now, I did uh, this commentary a couple weeks ago and got some feedback from folks all over the board. And a lot of people were like, oh, I can't believe you did the whole race. That's really long. And the whole time I'm thinking, I can't believe you don't know how to move your mouse on YouTube to get to the end if that's all you want to see. So just do that. Anyway, for those folks out there that are not experienced racers and want to learn a little bit more about how to race tactically, or you know, at least my opinion on how to race tactically, then I'll do the whole thing. And it's kind of fun. So I enjoy it. Hopefully you do. The views on the last video were pretty decent compared to some of my other videos, so I'm going to stick with it. So I've got my Garmin camera, and I'm sure I'll talk about this on the, the Saturday footage as well, but I'm, I messed up the Saturday footage because I had the Wi-Fi on the camera. I guess that eats up the battery pretty significantly. So this day I turned the Wi-Fi off and I turned the Bluetooth off, and then I finally, after watching some videos on YouTube on how my Garmin verb ultra 30 functions i uh got the hang of how to conserve some batteries so i have to say i found it extremely strange and fairly irritating that garmin did not include an instruction manual with the camera it just seems weird i know i can go online and get it but man a quick start guide or something for people without that would have been nice Boy, that's a jumbly piece of footage right there. Uh, maybe I can... Ooh, jeez, jeez, looks painful. This road was not was not quite that bumpy. But that thing sure is moving around a lot. I guess the... Uh, I'm suspecting the screw is loose. Okay, well, good information for future footage to make sure I secure that screw pretty, pretty well. Ah, oh, it's frustrating. I think I can add a little stabilization to the footage, so maybe it won't. Maybe what you're seeing won't look as bad as what I'm describing, but I bet it will. So, sorry for that. A little learning curve. Uh, not to get too weird, but I know why that happened. The reason that happened is the Garmin came with a knob that connects to my K-Edge mount, and intelligently, Garmin used a 4 millimeter. There's a thumb screw component to it, but you can only get it so tight with your fingers. But there's a four millimeter hex inside of the thumb screw. And I love that because, as you might imagine, I ride with fix it sticks on my bike in our bracket. And of course, there's a four millimeter in there. Uh, the reason that this camera is moving around today is because I used a normal GoPro. Well, there I am. There's the crew that caught up with me. So that's Barry. Uh, he will be active later, and Dan have bridged up to me, and they ended up bringing everybody else along, but uh, but that's okay. That was a fair move on their part, and kudos to everybody else for jumping on their wheel to have that happen, so no worries. Uh, but we're going to take a little break now that I look back and I see everybody has joined us. There's no reason for me to be up there anymore. Pretty sure I take a nice long deep breath here for quite some time. To get my wits about me. So. Man, I'm sorry about that footage. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the GoPro knobby has a Phillips head in it, and I don't have a Phillips head in my on bike collection of fix it sticks. So I can't get it very tight. Now I know that is a problem, and I will. Adjust that accordingly. Uh, learning curves. Good times. Good times. Well, at least this course is fairly smooth. So it's just that back section is pretty bumpy with the footage, but this entire loop section here is very, very smooth. So not so bad. And I'll do the best I can to use electronic stabilization to make that less shaky. So there's my teammate in front of me. That is John Robertson, uh, the world's smallest draft. But I was pretty thankful for whatever I could get at this little stage. So that is, well, there's a couple people up front there. I think that's Carlos 
And oh, that's Robert Barry, our series leader. And maybe Carlos that went up the road for a little poke. And you may remember from my other video that trying to pull that back is not something I want to participate in, so I didn't. Uh, and thankfully Dan got nervous enough that he thought he would do it. So Dan come, comes by and picks up the charge. There's my other roommate, uh, roommate my other teammate, Brent Roars, is ahead of John now, and they're going to get me back into this little move. So that was a critical piece of teamwork there that took place. So thank you, Mr. Roars. Mr. Roars suffered a bit in the end. Oh, not sure why I didn't stay on those wheels. Uh, yeah, so that gets uh, our small field riled up and everybody feels like they better close that up. So I think right there I told Dan that we are the last two riders and we have to uh, catch that train. So, so we do. So just to recap the weekend, on Saturday morning, this is Sunday, you're watching, on Saturday morning at 8 a.m. there was a time trial that was 7.6 miles that had a couple hills and a pretty good amount of headwind. I think I placed fifth in that overall out of seven people in my category doing the Omnium or the time trial, so okay, whatever. Um, my head was not screwed on totally straight for the TT. It wasn't bad, but it I certainly wasn't as focused as I needed to be, apparently. And then on Saturday's race, that occurred Saturday at 6 o'clock in the evening, was the crit race that our team is responsible for, uh, for our state series. And that one, I had a good race, tactically, and I'll talk about that in my other footage, so I won't, I'm sure you'll, if you listen to that, you'll hear, but the Reader's Digest on that is, I drafted extremely well, saved a lot of energy, and then in the last lap, it got a little hard on me, and I just sort of mentally shut off. I think physically I was comfortable. I really wasn't in that bad of shape, and when I did my sprint afterwards, I was barely tired. You know, I wasn't exhausted like I've been finishing with Masters category race or Masters 1, 2, 3 categories before. So, I don't know. I just think that was definitely a mental breakdown uh, that occurred on Saturday's race. So, on Sunday's race, I was very focused on getting my act together racing smart, and finishing strong. So today is another day of lots of focus on staying in the draft and keeping my head and body very low so I can conserve as much energy as possible. And trying to manage the wind that was out on the course, which was not overly significant, but it was enough to uh, definitely get your attention. Uh, it was worth paying attention to. So here on this side of the course, I am inbound uh, or inside the course and then when we get over to the other side I will be outside so as you're looking at the diagram the wind was blowing from your right to left across the course pretty straight pretty straight away from you know where it bumps out to the furthest to the right is where the wind was coming down so that back stretch before the final turn was headwind and then when we made that left to get into the final start finish, that was cross. This section of the course is a tailwind. And then as we round this sweeper, it turns into a crosswind. And of course, round and round we go, repeating the pattern. So that's Barry there to the right. He's He will eventually, shortly here, actually go on a breakaway. And he will do that solo. And tactically, the way that he pulls that off is there will be a preem coming up, and he'll break a leg to uh, to really charge for that preem. So I was thinking about that on Sunday and Monday, yesterday, today is Tuesday, two days after the race. So I was thinking about that mm, tactically, how I how I would maybe do things differently than what he did, even though he won the race. There's not not much to complain about, but um, what would I maybe do differently? And I have some thoughts. We'll see when he takes off. But he's just. Oh, there he goes. Okay, so that's that's the moment. The preem was called on the last lap. We're going down the headwind section. We're turning into this sharp left. And everyone, just so you know, everyone, every single person in this group knows that Barry will break away on us. There's not much that anybody wants to do about it. So he's extremely strong. So even if you were to catch that wheel and follow him right up, 
Oh man, you would really struggle to stay with him, even if you had a sheltered wind. And for some reason, he didn't mind you being on his wheel all day. You would struggle to stay with him for the rest of this race. So we're 15 minutes into the race. It ended up being right on a 60 minute race. So he's going to have 45 minutes of solo fun times all by himself out there. And what I found was impressive is, so we come across, we, the preem, he wins whatever the preem was, probably uh, toilet paper and paper towels, which is what I won later for a second place finish. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but man, it's awesome. You come home to the wife and you have paper towels and toilet paper. Who doesn't love that? So, you know, for the longest time, I thought the paper products at this uh, event were sort of hokey, but man, I'm, I'm a believer now. So happy, happy to have those utilitarian items given away to us. So, so everyone knows Barry's going to go up the road, but there's not a whole lot that anybody can do about it, like I said. So we are coming across the backstage, uh, backstretch here, and the rider who's leading us, and I don't know exactly who it is, but if I had to guess, I would say it was Brian Turney, is uh, giving us some shelter to do some pulls, which is nice, but no one's really taking up the mantle. It might be Robert Barry up there, too. No one's really taking up the mantle to work together to catch Barry. I just think no one was really that concerned about it. Barry was not doing the Omnium, so none of the competitors that are working for the overall, which was probably half the field, had some amount of concern about the Omnium points. Uh, nobody really cared that he was up the road, so, so he's just going to go. And what I was going to say is the amount of ground that he covers in such a short amount of time is demoralizing. So when you catch your breath after that preem and you think, oh, maybe I'll jump up there. He's already so far up the road that it's hard to, it's hard to picture that taking place. So, and this course is certainly not conducive to breakaways. It's pretty tough to hide. There's long, long sight lines you can see right here. If you look over to the left, you can see quite a ways uh, to a rider that might be off the front. So. Anyway, that's the last time we'll see Barry until about the last three laps. And then we'll see Barry again, because he laps us. So, some idea of the level of uh, fitness and talent that Barry possesses. His real name, I think, is Albertus. So I'm not sure if he likes Albertus. Apologies. I'm not 100% sure that it's pronounced Albertus, so I'm going to stick with Barry. Hope that's okay. And I'm doing this video in one take, so it's going to be okay. <laughs> All right, so now we uh, settle in for the duration. And this could, could be a process where I might, uh, I might go ahead and fast forward some of this because it gets pretty repetitive after a while. I'm trying to avoid doing that in these race recap videos because, again, I think a lot of the folks who may watch this are just looking for background noise, uh, more like a podcast. So... The process of droning on and on and on is somewhat okay. Or you might be watching this on your trainer in winter. But I have to say this race would not be the most exciting one even to watch on a trainer, but who knows? It's sunny. It looks warm. It looks better than your basement, so there could be that happening. So the Garmin overlay, uh, I'm just curious. I don't know if it's too small to see. I think it's too small, but the uh, the one I picked was this one for this for this weekend's races. Uh, the beat per minute, that's my heart rate on the left. A recap on my particular ticker is it doesn't go much past 165, so my 170 is absolutely maxed out. So pretty comfortable right now, of course, at 143, very comfortable, but just to give you some idea of the range of my, my wee little heart. Uh, of course, cadence above all that. And I was really focusing on trying to keep a high cadence. I kind of go in and out of the focus on that throughout the race. But I have been finding lately that a higher cadence leaves me fresher for the battle that ensues in the last two laps. So that's definitely something I've been focusing on. And then the big, 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 big focus for me this weekend was to stay closer to wheels. Now, I think it's interesting that after doing the video a couple weeks ago and noticing how poorly I was at staying close to a wheel, that has made a significant impact on my ability to, to correct that. And that has to be the video, right? I mean, I, I wouldn't have picked up on that had I not 
posted a video and commented it, commented on it myself, realizing that I am pretty terrible at holding a draft in any significant way. And you can see in this video, I did change the zoom setting, so it does it does look closer than the fisheye of the previous GoPro. But in any event, I really, really tried to focus on getting a draft and keeping a draft. So in this back section, just to reiterate, if these riders would be over to the right, we'd all be guttered. Hopefully you're familiar with that word, but it basically means trying to reduce the amount of impact that drafting has by pushing it, pushing all the other riders behind you into the curb, so to speak. So you can't get as much relief from the wind as you could if that rider was off to the left on that back section. We'd all be getting, we could echelon or fan out in succession just the way that a, a goose, a, a geese fly across the sky when they're migrating. So that echelon process is all about saving energy and conserving conserving lots. So again, it's uh, the name of the game here is reserving your matches, as it's referred to in cycling. So cumulative effort is what you want to really focus on keeping down during your race. So every time that you get up and sprint and hit 700 watts, 700 watts, 700 watts to close that after a corner, the worse off it is for you at the end when you really need every little last watt you can have to stay with the group or get a good kick on a sprint finish, whatever the case is. So very important concept to keep in mind is to stay close. And that was revealed to me by watching the video and how poorly I was at holding a wheel and how much that impacted my power outputs and then my heart rate. So in those last videos, the heart rates were, were definitely higher than they were today. Of course, those last courses had some hills, so that had some effect. This is a pancake flat uh, race, and here we all are fanned out. Everyone's getting a little break. We've all fully decided that Barry is going to win this race. And now we're all kind of thinking about what we want to do to try to get on the podium today. Uh, and so that's the plan. So Robert Barry, again, the series leader, uh, just crushed us in the time trial as well on sa sa Saturday morning. Uh, and then he won Saturday's crit race as well. He is out here uh, doing some pulling on Sunday's race. So. So we're clicking along, 24 miles an hour, and obviously not crushing it, so Robert is not destroying himself uh, to maintain that. And some riders really like to do the pulling so they can keep a relatively high heart rate and just makes their body feel better to be working a little bit harder. I am, I am not one of those riders. I prefer to hide as much as humanly possible, so that's my plan. Uh, and again, just much closer drafting than I did in, in years past. Um, it was, a, it was. I, I have to say, it was a significant difference in the way that I was drafting in this race versus pretty much every other race I've ever done. So I think the video stuff uh, really does pay off. So hopefully you learn something from it. But even if you don't, I certainly am, and that will definitely come into play every time I watch my sprint finishes. Uh, and video, there's things that I would do differently. And today's no different. Not much I would argue with by the time we get done watching this one. There's not much I would do in the finish that would be different other than have stronger legs. <laughs> but tactically, I, it was as good as it could be, I think. So, so Brian, uh, there he goes, on an attack. So Brian did those these attacks pretty frequently throughout the race. Really, really strong rider. Really wish I had some of that aerobic capacity to just go again and again and again and again, and uh, but I, I don't have that. So, uh, however, I will say that tactically, this part is interesting. So, Brian did that attack, and he does this a couple times throughout the race. Um, I'm not sure why I'm doing that. Maybe we had a little bit of a split. I thought I'd contribute. Hard to say. I'm not ready for uh, a front and back camera just yet. So we are not going to know the answer to that. I don't remember doing this during the race. 
interesting. Another another part of having a video that's kind of compelling. So definitely slow down. 240 watts there, right? And of course people are going to come by, and they do. So thank you, gentlemen, for doing some more pulling. Appreciate that. Find myself a place to tuck in. It's Mr. Derek. Let's see if I can sneak in behind Derek here. So this last turn that we're going into is a little bit hairy. Um, it's definitely greater than 90. Not by much, but greater than 90. There's gravel there. The road was swept, so it's no complaints there. Um, it's almost it's almost a little off camber. So when you're skipping through there, there's a little bit of broken pavement right at the apex as well. So when you're skipping through there, it's definitely get your attention. Um, and so I was describing to somebody the process of racing. So when you're racing this course, you know, you're hitting these turns again and again and again and again and again. So you obviously get a good hang of it. But in the last two laps, everyone amps up the wattage significantly. So the amount of speed that you're carrying in the last couple corners makes those corners unlike they've been throughout the entirety of the race. So it totally changes the game from what you are used to all day long. You've been hitting that same corner in that same line. And then you ramp it up to eight, uh, race pace, or, you know, last two lap race pace. And, oh man, is that different. And harrowing and attention getting and bare knuckles, right? So it's uh, it's very different. And there was a crash in this race. My poor teammate Brent went down pretty hard. I'm still not entirely sure. I guess he's not entirely sure what happened either. I think maybe his wheel just slipped in the corner and or his tire slipped and that was that. So uh, Derek in front of me was also taken out in that crash a bit. So those two gentlemen are banged up a bit this week, but I think they'll both recover just fine. Uh, so now we're guttered. Whoever is leading the charge right now has us right up against the gravel. And that's smart, because if you're going to give a draft, try to give as little draft as possible to your competitors. If we're not going to try to chase Barry, which we've all definitely decided is not going to happen at this point. So the drafting is paying off for me. I'm having a really good day on keeping my watts low, my heart rate at 142. I mean, that is just that is nice to see in a race. That's great. So I'm having a, a lounge chair ride, uh, and I'm able to stay up front. Again, it was a really small course because of Mother's Day or whatever, or a small field because of Mother's Day, whatever the case was, but you, know, you still have to race smart. It's just, to some extent, a smaller field is tricky because there's, there's four or five guys in here that could rip your legs off, and then there's four or five guys in here that are hanging on for dear life, so to speak. Not, maybe not that bad, but they're hanging on, you know? So I'm one of the hanger honors. I can't go out there and do what Brian just did, is attack and think, all right, I'm going to sit out here for the next half an hour by myself. So Brian goes, that's Dan. These two are some of the stronger guys in the field. Robert Barry on the front, Carlos behind him. Those four are probably the str and of course, uh, Barry, who's up the road. But those four are probably the strongest group. Apologies if I forgot anybody back behind me right now, but I'm definitely not one of these guys that can just sit out there. So on this attack, oh, okay, this is, Carlos is going to close this down, which is nice. He's doing a lot of work to catch that up. I've got to ask Carlos what he's got in the back of his jersey there. That's quite something. I don't know what that is. Looks painful, I guess. <laughs> so Carlos pulls me up. He gives me a little flick, and I'm like, nope. So I kick to get away from him. Like, I'm not going to... I like Carlos, but I don't want to give him a free draft to catch this group. Because if I catch that group and we, all three of us, can stick and battle away, that's great because Carlos is such a strong rider. I don't, I don't want to help Carlos a ton because he's way stronger than me. So uh, anyway, again, some differences between... I have huge differences between how people act in a group ride and how people act in a race. So that was a race move where Carlos did all that work to get me within shooting distance and then I take off and leave Carlos to his own devices after he just pulled. That didn't work because Carlos is beast and he's right there. So be it. You gotta try stuff, you know? See what happens. So Dan up in front is a uh, relatively newcomer to our area. I think he lived in Arizona, if I remember correctly. Met him last year on the cross practice course. Very nice guy. 
hoping to get some uh, youth mountain bike rolling in our area. So hats off to Dan for that activity. And uh, hopefully we'll see him tonight on the group ride. It's, it's uh, nice to have a fresh face with strong legs in our area to change things up a little bit. So it's kind of fun. So we're bunched up here a little bit. We'll see if Brian does another attack. Brian's on the front again. He's got that orange kit, light blue helmet, the POC helmet. Let's we'll see if he does another attack. So again, just as a recap, Barry is totally gone. There's one rider is up the road. He has probably got a half a lap on us. Everyone else is vying for second, third, and whatever else happens. So now we're being guttered, which is smart. However, if this is the part where I think this happens, Brian again is on the front. He's got us guttered. Uh, yep, there he goes. So he attacks. Well, this is where I take exception to that attack. So he attacks. And, well, maybe I don't take exception to that. What I was going to say, I guess this is wrong when I think about it. You know, if he had us guttered and then attacked, but the way that he attacked people could follow him in his slipstream and echelon out. So initially I was thinking you would want to do the opposite of that, but that's not the case, because you would want to have people guttered ahead of your attack so they're a little fatigued and not able to respond to your attack. So hats off, Brian. Uh, when I was out there during the race, I thought I thought I would not have done it that way, but now that I'm processing that a little bit more, that probably is the right way to do that. Uh, I guess the difference would be how quickly you can mount that attack and create separation. And I would say this, doing an attack like that when you're on the front of the group might not be the best place for that to take place. So that was a preem lap. I think that's when I won my toilet paper. Uh, oh no, I take that back. That was the mid-race points for the Omnium, and that was an important moment. So I ended up getting third place because Barry, who's up the road, is not taking place in the Omnium. So the points were distributed 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and Robert, who won the Omnium series, got first. Carlos, who got second in the Omnium series, got second, and I got third in the Omnium series and got third in that sprint. And you will pretty much see that sprint repeat itself at the end of the race as well. Um, I should have learned from that. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, and my list of excuses. I was sick all weekend, so keep that in mind. Um, so that gave me some points to... I'm not sure where that propelled me on the road in terms of the points competition, but it ended up being important in the end. And also, at the end of this race, the two people I was battling for third place... It didn't fare as well as I did in the sprint, so they lost more points. They weren't right behind me, and they didn't beat me. So that's how I was able to get third in the Omnium overall. But again, I had no inclination of having that as part of my plan when I started this day. This day was all about clearing my head from Saturday's sort of debac last lap debacle and uh, trying to just have a good race uh, today. So it was a total bonus that I ended up in third for the Omnium overall. And uh, I got a couple bucks for that, which is nice, but mostly it was just nice to be, to get a podium shot, because those are few and far between for me. So I got two podium pictures from today's event. I was third place in this race, and then I was third place in the Omnium overall. So this is the finishing order that you'll see uh, in another half an hour. <laughs> is Robert is up front pulling us, and then there's Carlos, and then I finished third uh, in this sprint. So, no, I take that back. Carlos, I beat Carlos uh, because Barry got first, Robert Barry got second, and Brian Davis got third. That's me. So I nipped Carlos at the line, which gave me more Omnium points and got me third place on the podium for this particular race. Got it. That's what happened. You wouldn't think this would be so hard for me to remember these things two days later, but apparently it is. 
So here Robert has this guttered right up into the gravel. Uh, and, it, and there was this little section I know it was right here. There was a little gravel on the road and you could hear your tires kick that gravel up. So there was a little mental game that I started to play every time we got cornered or uh, guttered into this uh, section there that I, I knew that was coming because that's the that's why I like crits because they're repetitive. You can really work on improving yourself during the race. And I think that's cool. Road races do not give you that opportunity. Everything is coming at you new and fresh and different. But a repetitive course, I enjoy because you can you can make adjustments throughout the race to give yourself a better chance as the race goes on. So I do a lot of thinking during the races. One of the things I was thinking is, it's okay that I hear my tire making some noise rolling over gravel. My tire is not going to give out on me on that sweeping turn. It's not going to be an emergency. So just because you hear that sound, which is albeit a little bit frightening, doesn't mean you should get all worked up about it. So stay in that draft. Don't get agitated about hearing some sound. And focus on staying low and keeping your draft. And that's what I did. So there you go. A dig by Carlos going into this turn. And thankfully, Robert does not want that to happen. So I can just cruise on Robert too. So again, Robert and Carlos are sort of battling over the Omnium point series. Well, that one was for the toilet paper. All right, that was a preem. I got second place, I think, for that preem. It was a one, two, three field preem, and that generated some toilet paper and paper towels for our family. So, very happy about that. Carlos is looking around here for some separation. So, uh, and then there's Brian is going to be trying his best to put in a counterattack after that preem, after knowing Carlos is a little bit gassed, he's going to put in a counterattack. Now, right now, if Brian had moved over to gutter all of us, Carlos, who just finished that preem, who just had to close this attack that he saw coming a mile away, but he saw it coming from Brian, I feel like if Brian would have moved over quick, more quickly to the gutter, I know that was still tailwind on that side, now we're getting guttered, but he's still too far away from that white line. He should be right on that line, so Carlos is not getting any break. But right now, Carlos is getting plenty of break. I'm getting break. The people behind us are probably not. So an important thing to think about is the wind, and that's something, again, from these videos I really wanted to work on. I think in my first video, the one where I got dropped, I mentioned how terrible I am at determining wind direction and how that translates to where I should be hiding throughout the course of the race and some extra attention on how you want to develop your finishing strategy based on wind. You can't control where the riders are going to end up, but in an ideal world, depending on wind, you can think about how your sprint should be unfolding, uh, trying to take a draft into the protected side and sprinting out of it, which ultimately is what happens in this sprint. So you'll see that later. Good for me. There's a, a tactical difference maybe on how the final sprint was accomplished. Um, and we'll talk about that when we get to it. So, so there you go. I did uh, get into the pro race for a little while after this event because uh, I didn't have any more racing to do. So again, if you've been watching along with me, the more racing opportunities you can get, the more improvements that you'll see in your fitness. So it's hard for me to recover from the Masters 1, 2, 3 race and then turn around in the pro race. Very difficult for me to do that, but it's definitely something I want to work on this year. So I couldn't do that Saturday because I needed to save as much energy as I could for the Omnium in this race on Sunday. But after this race, I don't really care what happens, so I'm going to jump into the pro race. But the pro race started off with my teammate, Mr. Andy Webb, jumping off to a like, first lap, jumping off to a solo uh, seat. Now, there's Brian attacking again, sort of. I guess that was kind of a half-hearted half attempt. Uh, but again, if you're going to attack from that side, I would say move straight to the gutter as soon as you can to make it as hard as possible for everybody else. But they're incremental, incremental types of strategies, but for as many times as Brian attacked, that would have an effect on all of us by guttering us again and again and again because he's such a strong rider. Um, 
that that can certainly have an effect. So. But everybody's got their own style, that's for sure. That's the fun part. Everybody's got their own little strategies and their own way of working, their own opinions on how to do things. I'm just offering you up mine. There's a great chance that my opinions are not accurate because I am a uh, mildly unsuccessful racer in my own right. Uh, but I try. And it's fun. A day like this for me is a lot of fun because it's a nice safe course. Um, I know pretty much everybody and that's you know another advantage of this small tiny field. There's a good chance I know everybody I'm racing with. I think I knew everybody. I would say on Saturday I had a nice conversation with a fellow racer, Brian Leatherman, watched my previous video and made a point to come up and introduce himself. And I thought that was really nice. Um, so I also had another idea. I feel, I feel like with the size of our fields in Wisconsin and how, how nice Wisconsin is, we should all just have a quick hand, shake of hands before the race and make sure everybody knows each other. Not everybody, but, you know, just look to your right. Hey, how's it going, man? Good to see you. Blah, blah, blah. I just think that would be nice. Personal opinion. So, uh, yeah. So I got in the pro race, sorry, um, and Andy went off the front right away, and then I did the best I could to what we call blocking, and blocking is something that takes some amount of subtlety, because you don't want to be a jerk, you don't want to be in the way, and certainly don't want to hit your brakes or anything ridiculously unsafe like that, but the way that would work is you would go to the front, let's just imagine for the sake of this exercise that... Uh, that we had a teammate up front right now. One of our Diablo riders might, this would be a good opportunity, might jump to the front on this part of the course, going into this 90 degree or better turn, and we would go a little bit slower than the field would be comfortable with or would want to be doing right now. So especially as our imaginary rider is establishing his break up the road, we would just be up there kind of messing up the rhythm. And again, not being completely in the way, but... Uh, just being a little bit of a distraction is enough to get the job done. So you want the other riders to have a disrupted rhythm is all you're trying to accomplish. You're not, you, you're not trying to be in their way physically that they can't get around you or anything absurd like that or certainly create any danger. And if you have any, when in doubt, get out of the way. <laughs> so if you're not comfortable on the blocking thing or you think, I feel like I'm being a jerk, then just don't do it, because I don't, I think it's like a 2% difference, right? It's not a huge thing. It makes a difference, but it's not a huge thing, uh, because there's a fine line between disrupting their rhythm. There's three things, I guess. There's a fine line between disrupting their rhythm, being in the way, but you also want them to do the work to bring your teammate back, so that theoretically you could relaunch a counterattack once all these folks work so hard to pull back your teammate. So that's the thing with brakes, and I'm no brake expert, believe me, because that's not where I, where I ride. But if anybody else has an opinion on a brake, I'd welcome a, a video uh, analysis that differs, or even a comment in the YouTube, in the YouTube's below. Speaking of the YouTube's below, I guess I'll, I'll repeat this information because I think most people skip to the end to catch the last lap or two. But in any event, if you're listening to this, please click the thumbs up button, give this video a like, however your, whatever social media jargon that you're seeing this video, uh, show some sign of appreciation so that I know people are listening because it is a, a bit of, again, it's a bit of a hassle to put these things together, but as we're seeing, I'm learning a lot from them myself, so I'm not bothered by it, but it makes it way easier when I know there's people that actually watch these things. Uh, and learn anything from it. So if you got a favorite tip that you picked up, you know, put that out there. So speaking of, here's a tip, here's a strange tip. The uh, parking lot for this race is a pretty good distance away from the start finish. Um, so you have to do some walking. And you so when you're going to a race, you're bringing pit wheels, you're bringing your backpack that has your clothes, your change of clothes, your umpteen water bottles to get ready for the race, maybe you're, you're bringing a trainer, maybe you're bringing rollers, whatever the case, you have a lot of stuff. So this uh, winter we got a 
collapsible wagon that is awesome to have in the car to carry all that stuff in one shot so you don't have to make a bunch of trips back and forth. I can't tell you how nice that was to have at this race. And I used it a lot on the fat bike racing that I did over the winter as well. Same thing. The key with the wagon, I would say this. Another strange tip. Try to find a wagon that has gigantic wide wheels like you'd see on a, a lunar module because that'll get over all the uneven terrain, sand, snow, all that kind of stuff. That is the type of wagon that you want in the back of your car to fill up all your race gear, pull it up, uh, and, and make a day out of it. I w if I were designing a wagon, I would make some changes. So I would have a seat somehow built into the wagon, so once you got to your location, you could dump out all your stuff, and then somehow it would turn into a little folding chair. That would be cool. Or even a little umbrella over it, so once it did turn into a folding chair, you'd have some protection from the sun, and that would be like the ultimate racing wagon. Right? If only there was an inventor that could come up with something that cool, that'd be awesome. So, if you enjoy that idea, I encourage you to run with it. I look forward to your Kickstarter, and I will be one of your backers. Thanks. All right. 20 miles in almost. Heart rate is a wonderfully low 136. Very excited about that. Our average speed on this course was, was not that scintillating. Um, let me click on my Garmin here. And let's see what the averages were. <laughs> So 25 miles was the total distance. Average speed was 25.16 miles per hour. So it's okay. Uh, max speed of 36 miles per hour. Average power, oh, max power, 1,356. Normalized power, 294 watts. Uh, and again, my threshold is somewhere around 300, 310, is somewhere in that range. So 294 is pretty good amount of watts, I guess. So that's a little higher than I was expecting it to be. So speaking of Garmin's, I got that, I had a Garmin warranty issue. My USB charger on the back of the Garmin I had a, one of the little pins broke, so it could no longer get power. I ordered a new one from warranty. They shipped that out. I shipped my old one back. And that all should be free. Uh, and I really appreciate that they ship you the new one first. Because if they didn't do that, I would not have had a power readout for the time trial. And I would not have had power readout or overlay information for Saturday's crit. Or the summary information I just gave you, I wouldn't have any of that if they didn't send the new Garmin out first. So, thanks Garmin. Although, I have to say, it would be way better if you had a more robust USB. So I think that is the second USB that I broke. Do uh, sorry, my computer is unpowered right now. So, oh man, I'm trying to plug it in. And it's not working. Ah, there it goes. Okay, tragedy averted. Sorry for the distraction. Okay, that is Brent. We've got about ten minutes left of racing. Not sure how many laps that is. So there's Brian attacking from the back. That was good. I, f I feel like I feel like he attacked um, harder once he got closer to the front. And, and maybe it would be better off to attack hard in the back because then he's carrying more speed as he goes by the people in the front, and people are less apt to be able to jump on that wheel. But man, he sure did a lot of attacks. Super strong rider. I wish I had some of that power to be able to jump like that and have really have the confidence, the self-confidence to know that I could do a big watt effort. And if I did get separation, that I could then hold that. I don't have that. I don't have that confidence. But I can sprint, more or less. That's my thing. So, intelligently. Play to your strengths when you're racing, and that's what I'm going to do. In training, work on your weaknesses. In racing, play to your strengths. Oh, there's a little slowdown there. That was 
nearly tragic, but tragedy averted. My friend from Velocause apologized. I'm sure it was not his fault, but nonetheless, I'm oh, sorry about that. No problem. No crash, no foul. So now I'm on the right side of the wind. <coughs> sorry for the cough. Still sick. Another attack. Now mentally I'm getting pretty fatigued by this point, so these attacks are definitely working. They're having an effect on me. There's a thousand watts it took me to button that one up. Uh, so they're definitely having an effect on my ability to want to compete at the end of this day. And I know there was about this time, 10 minutes, 5 minutes left, I was kind of having those thoughts creep in like yesterday. Now yesterday's thoughts took over where I just got so fatigued physically and mentally that I just sort of threw in the towel on the whole day, even though we're at the last minute of competition. But today I was really determined not to do that, so I spent some time at this portion of the race trying to keep my head screwed on straight, and I do have some tricks for that. Um, yeah, so my trick for that is I have a little trigger Hypnotists, I saw a hypnotist a, a couple of years ago, and this was one of the tips. Oh, there's Barry. So Barry has lapped the field. I believe the announcers gave him $40 to do that, so he's lapped the field. And he's back. And he's huffing and puffing, and he's a ball of sweat and salt and everything else. He, he looks a little worse for wear, uh, as, he, as he should. He was working hard for that. So now this is funny. He tells Carlos, his teammate, in the light blue up there, that he's back. But Carlos knows he's back and start, well, because the announcer said it, so Carlos knows he's back, and now Carlos is already asking him, hey, man, get up here and get up here and do something. And I'm joking around, and I yell back at Carlos, hey, man, give the guy a minute. He just left the field. So, see, he's waving him up, like, come on, do something, and then Barry surprisingly says, okay, go, right then, and Carlos attacks. Now, I have to say I'm not clear on... What, what that would accomplish? I'm really not. Maybe I, I'm happy to be enlightened. I'd love to learn what the thought process was on that attack. <coughs> From Carlos's perspective. So just because Barry's back in the field, now you have a super strong teammate back with you. You know he can recover, even though he just left the field. You know he's still got some, uh, got some power to throw down. But, but still, wow. I just, I'm just not clear on that attack. So. I don't know. I don't understand how that could have worked out for them. Again, I'd love love some feedback on that if if they're listening or anyone else has an opinion on that particular moment. Um, so there you go. I'm gonna move up here in a minute, just a t just a touch, and I've got a couple laps left. And I know I put the sound on. Uh, we're getting we're getting pretty close to where I'm going to put the sound back on on the last, more or less the last lap. So attack from Dan. You see, the, there is the downside to a lot of these guys that can sit out there and power away for 20 minutes at a time. They they don't necessarily have a jump to be able to create create separation. So we got you know that little separation. Oh, there's a lot of watts. There's a lot of watts. I got all worked up there at 1,200 watts, which is fine. You know, you, sometimes you got to close the gap yourself. That happens. But right at the end of the race, to blast out 1,200 watts, a minor bummer. But that's how life works. So, yeah, we're, get, we're getting pretty close. So, now Johnny is my teammate there ahead of us on Diablos, and then Brent. Also, my team, at, when we talked before the race, you know, our strategy was just go out and have fun. We didn't try to line anything up. There's not enough of us to do any. Oh, there's Barry. It's really smoothly. Goes a little bit off the road. Calmly collects himself and comes back on the road. Really well done, Robert Barry. Robert Barry. Appreciate that. So, that would have been truly unfortunate because he was leading the the Omnium points, if he had gone off the road or gotten dropped at this point, that would have really stunk. So good for him for jumping back in and holding onto that bike nice and loosely. All right, what we're going to see in this finish is uh, Carlos is going to get his teammate 
Barry to come back up to the front and do a lead out. I would argue that lead out started a little bit too early. Uh, given the size of our field, there's not a whole lot of danger involved here. Um, but I understand that he's trying to make us tired so that we can't sprint when they get going under the theory that Carlos is stronger than us, which is a pretty good theory. But I think Barry was maybe a little more gassed from that lapping the field effort. Uh, so Barry certainly puts on a big attack, but it, it wasn't enough to be totally decisive to shed the rest of us at this stage of the race in any event. So, And I would say, I'm telling you this in case the sound drowns me out, but when Barry pulls the lead out for Carlos, I feel like he pulled out just a hair too early. So Carlos is saying, come on, Barry, let's, let's rip this last lap. And you're about to see Barry, and I'm going to turn the sound back on shortly here. So there's Barry. Carlos is going to grab that wheel, and since that was pretty well advertised, I'm going to get right in that mix. So uh, I can't hear the sound, but I know the sound is playing when I unplug this microphone. So, so right now, Barry has lapped the field, and we had a question after the race as far as lapped riders or riders that do, in fact, lap the field. So we got a little clarification from USA Cycling, and we were trying to determine what's legal and potentially what's ethical or sporting uh, or common custom in our area. So apparently, if in Barry's case, since he lapped the field, he's more than welcome to come up and lead out his teammate to try to get second place. That's pretty obvious. But in the other situation where uh, the lapped rider or somebody gets dropped, and then we lap them and they jump back in for the last lap to try to lead out their teammate. What's that ruling? And apparently that is okay with USA Cycling. So I just thought that was an interesting take. There's a little more detail to that explanation. And I'll ask uh, my friend Brent, who is asking the official how that goes down, or if any officials out there are watching uh, a comment of clarification about lapped riders would be great, or anybody else that wants to go look up the rule. So just... Food for thought. Thanks. Bye. I'm in a very happy spot for Brian right now. Third wheel. I'd like to ease myself over to the other side of Carlos's wheel here. Robert is not not a big fan of that, but we'll see. We'll see who gets this wheel here. I have enough draft there. I'm not so worried about it. I think I'm going to give Robert that. Shuffle back one more, and so Carlos uh, and Barry are putting out a lot of power, but it's not. It's not a total crusher, uh, but it's definitely enough to keep anybody from doing a half lap attack from the back, that's for sure. So it does eliminate that process, which would have been uh, a racer like Brian that was doing all that pulling earlier, or a racer like Dan. I'm not sure their sprints are extremely powerful, but they would be the type of racer that would do a half lap attack, and that is out of the cards for them because Barry is pulling so hard on this last lap. So we're coming in to the final little bit here, and Barry's starting to suffer. And Carlos is going to call him off, in my opinion, a little early. Uh, and there's Brian doing an attack. Barry's going to close that, if I remember correctly. Pretty much close it. We're going to get Brian back before we go into the last turn, even. So. Oh, we have a whole other lap? Oh, Barry. Barry, bro. <laughs> so, yeah, that poor guy laps the field and has to pull two laps. Oh, I didn't, did not figure that out. Oh, man, that's crazy. Okay, well, let's start that commentary over. So, Brian goes to the front and pulls. Brian has no teammates in this race, so I'm not sure why he would do that instead of, Brian would have stayed in the field a little longer, like maybe in this section of the course, and tried to really put a bomb attack on, Barry would have been in a rough spot. Now Barry should move over and gutter all of us except Carlos, um, in my opinion, but it's hard to have those thoughts when you're gassed. I definitely understand that, but we're all getting a pretty good draft coming up into this sprint right now. That's good for me. I need all the help I can get. Alright, Barry 
battery's still pulling. Oh, can you imagine? I cannot. So my heart rate, 157. I think my high for the day, 164. Probably about to see that. 29 miles an hour going into this turn. And okay. we're, we're starting to soften up because it's just not quite hard enough. Uh, so you get this feeling that people are going to start shooting around you. And they would have if we had a bigger field today, but it was so small there wasn't much concern. So Carlos pulled Barry off. Barry's just cooked. Um, maybe a hair too early. Maybe if Carlos would have let Barry do this last turn, it would have bunched us all up. But Carlos is better at attacking from further out, I think. So here goes the sprint. Carlos gets a good jump, takes that turn great. Uh, Robert Barry, uh, not as great on the turn, didn't get as much draft from Carlos, but still strong enough to come around Carlos for the first place finish. I got second in that sprint, and I was pretty happy with that. So that is the end of our race. Thanks for watching. Click like, share this with your friends, post it on YouTube, or post it on Facebook. Tweet about it, Instagram about it, and we'll see you at the races. Please introduce yourselves. Thanks. Bye-bye.